This is the second of this year's uh, MR seminars, and we have uh, Professor Roger C. Pat. Uh, many of you know who Roger is, so he doesn't need an introduction, uh, but I just would like to say that he's been a uh, professor of industrial relations, and I worked with him in the same university for my first 15 years until the university decided to get rid of the most activist uh, people, the leaders of the union, and they closed the department. And since then, since 2010, Roger is uh, in Wolverhampton University. So, still doing the same research, uh, same important uh, uh, contribution, and now uh, he's going to talk to us about. The working class, what is working class, who is, who is working class at the moment uh, in the age where everything is changing? Well, thank you for that. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. I uh, often say I get invited to a very large number of speaking rooms all over the world, but I never get invited twice. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll discover why. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm always very grateful that somebody new has decided to experiment. Um, the, uh, one of the issues is obviously when you're uh, lecturing uh, students, uh, you have some notion, even, even today, <laughs> that they have some common knowledge background. And then I do a lot of work with the trade unions, and they have something. But groups such as yours are much more diverse, so some of you probably know far more than I do about these issues and about uh, labour markets and uh, the nature of class. And others will know less, but different. And also there's clearly some generational issues. Uh, so if I say things uh, which are unclear, which I will, uh, please interrupt. I don't mind interruptions. I've been interrupted uh, by a very large number of people. Some not that long ago, leaders of one of the biggest unions stormed out of a meeting I was addressing, shouting abuse as they left. Um, and that was about the, the history of the 1966 seafarers strike. So if I could get them rowing on that, I could probably get them rowing about anything. So I thought I'd focus, I mean, one of the temptations is always to start, if you like, at the end and talk about the current issues that everybody's talking about, not just Brexit, but the world situation, what sort of person is Trump, if he is actually a person. Uh, you know, what's going on in all these international, national things, what's happening to globalization and capitalism, because that's what people talk about, want to talk about. But my great hero is uh, a writer called Lewis Carroll, are you all familiar with Lewis Carroll? Yes. Alice in Wonderland. And he was one of the greatest writers ever. And what people forget is his day job was the professor of philosophy at Oxford University. And he wrote these children's stories, not just for fun and fantasy, uh, but because he wished to illustrate philosophical dilemmas and attack his opponents. Uh, then, like now, academics are quite shy of openly attacking each other, believe it or not. So Lewis Carroll disguised his opponents in various forms in order to attack them. And he had a phrase which I subscribed to, which he said, you should always begin at the beginning, uh, which sounds obvious. But actually, in most political debate, and most economic arguments, people don't start at the beginning. And they start rowing like this again, because they haven't gone back to where so really, in many sense, I want to try and build an analysis where we begin at the beginning, and so that better informs the end, which is the current debates, in order to get some sort of context and perspective, which is interestingly difficult when you're living through turbulent times. Very difficult to see what's going on, isn't it? And what's a trend and what's a tendency. Um, and really, for Marxists, um, people on the left generally, various associations of communist socialists. Uh, they come as the, uh, I think it was famously in an episode of Homer Simpson, where he said the devil comes in many guises. <laughs> so from the point of view of our enemies, we are the devil, and the left comes in many guises with many names. 
Not always is the name accurate. So sometimes the Democratic People's Republic doesn't actually reflect what's going on in the country. Um, and really, the, the core of a Marxist analysis, not only what Marx wrote, but what Marx is today, the starting point is always class. We live and we talk openly about living in a class society. We talk about class struggle. Uh, and it seems to me that is still, <coughs> I'm not arguing that it's the only issue, and I'm not saying that it explains everything. But what I am arguing is that it's an incredibly useful starting point. And it's always instructive to listen to the BBC, because the BBC for a long time says there's no such thing as class. And then talked after the Brexit referendum about the northern industrial working class who voted to leave. So they had say, and then they say the traditional working class. So there's a traditional, then there's an industrial one, then there's a post-industrial one, then there's poor workers who live in seaside towns who aren't industrial workers, and so there is class, <laughs> but then they don't clear what they mean by it. So not only should we start with a class analysis, but we need to be clear. Now the reason it I think helps is because we use certain phrases. We talk about class interests. So what is the working class, what is, is there an objective working class interest? Now I debated recently with a rather unpleasant professor from Manchester University, and it was just the two of us having a debate in Manchester, and he said he hated people like me and Jeremy Corbyn, which I was flattered that he should even mention us, <laughs> and so great, uh, uh, because we presumed to know what was good for the working class. So this is often a, an attack, isn't it, on the left? Uh, particularly left intellectuals, I use the term loosely, that we are saying this is objectively what's best, this is what's in the working class interest. And they say you're arrogant and you're adventurists because, and you're vanguardist because you're deciding what's best for them, but actually the British working class know perfectly well what's best for them, which is to kick out immigrants, to accept low wages, and to watch reality TV. And apparently that's not an arrogant position to take, mm -hmm. that these people take. So one thing is, is there a, a sense of an objective working class interests? And then the question is of working class struggle. In other words, uh, most people are, believe in struggle, not just in talking about it, but doing it. And you'll see in struggle, where you see demonstrations and strikes and riots and all sorts, there are people in struggle. And we talk about the class struggle. So that's linked to class. And we also talk about class consciousness. And I was reading, you talk about getting worried, a book written in the early 60s about called Armies and Politics, about military coups in countries like Venezuela. <laughs> this is 1962. And he, he quoted Lenin, and he said, Lenin's explanation for the problem of political power was a lack of consciousness amongst the working class. So that consciousness, workers being aware that they are workers, that they have things in common, that they have a, a, a clear definition that they are not the bosses, that they are not. So it's not just who we are, but what we're not. Consciousness is an important part. And of course, it's an important part of struggle to raise consciousness. And we often talk about it, don't we? <coughs> Raising consciousness, propaganda, agitation, meetings like this, and so on. But also, of course, we talk about class organisations. So it's not enough to have consciousness and struggle and interest. We have to have organisations reflect it. So I've spent most of my life working inside and with the trade union movement in this country, and still do. And obviously, that's a major manifestation. But trade unionism throughout the Western world is in decline. I mean, significant decline. Not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of influence and impact. Now, that doesn't mean to say it's gone, and it doesn't mean to say it's gone forever. Because again, I was reading a book written in 1912, where the guy was saying, oh, it's the end of the British trade union movement. You know, 10 years later, it was thriving. So we can't, we can write it off, but we have to be clear. We can't just be romantic and hope it will come back. And it may never come back in the form that we associate with it. So we have to think clearly and carefully about it. And then the final thing, which would depress the hell out of all of us. I was going to sort of say the evening is a sort of depressing, hopeful dismay, I think, 
might be a way of looking at what we're doing, is the balance of class forces. So we talk about this balance, this notion that somebody's got more power than us, and they're using it, shock horror, to smash working class organisations, culture, identity, and even hope, you know, just smashing it. And this is, and here we are on the, the back foot, apparently, in the retreat. Now, this is not a position all over the world, but certainly parts of the UK, this is true. So we look at the balance of class forces, and this is important for tactical reasons, because, for example, shouting in the streets that we want a general strike in a period where there are virtually no strikes of any kind is fanciful and is mistaking the nature of the balance of class. Of course, the general strike is fine, but not all the time, absolutely. It's a tactic that we have to use carefully, and in order to use it correctly, we have to have a serious analysis of the balance of class forces. So, in all of this, class needs to be dealt with. Is that okay? Yes? Can I carry on? You can stop me at any point and say, let's go to the parliament. I don't worry about that. Okay, so without, we don't have time, but obviously, before, just before the nature of class, we have to remind ourselves about the nature of politics. And politics, of course, is the display of power. It's about power. It's not parliamentary dramas and ins and outs. It's about the exercise, the gaining, exercise and sustaining of power, and in particular, state power. And we know that part of the Brexit argument is about returning state power to the state of the UK, for good or ill. I mean, that's part of the debate, isn't it? And we're not unique. I had a... I was in a... a a Dublin pub not long ago, which is not necessarily the safest place to be, uh, if, like me, you were advocating uh, Brexit. And uh, it got quite rowdy. I don't know if you've been to Dublin. It can get quite rowdy, anyway. And um, apparently we were quite noisy. And this group of very, very drunk Dutchmen came up to us and started shouting abuse. They were on a whiskey-drinking tour of Ireland. So they were... And they were shouting, they said, you, you people voting to leave? I said, hold on, half of your country want to leave. Mm -hmm. At least 50% of the French want to leave. It's not a uniquely British thing that we want to leave. And so, <clears throat> it's and one of the reasons is an instinctive view of state power. That if you have a supernatural organisation like the European Union, where does state power lie? <coughs> And if it lies away from me, so far away from me I can't do anything about it, then that is a frustration and a genuine one. So part of that debate is around the nature of state power. But the key concept that Marxists have about state is that the state is an instrument of class rule. And this is an important concept because it differentiates from the notion of national rule. So... Governments, particularly of the right, Macron in France, Merkel in Germany and others, wrap themselves in their flag and say, we are ruling in the national interest. When they talk about the economy, they talk about the economy, the national economy, the national interest. We are doing the things that's in the best interests of the nation. So they try to pretend that their control of state and state apparatus is a national issue, not a class issue. Marxists would say, no, you're not running the place for the national interest. You're running it for your particular class interests. This is the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. It may have some trappings of democracy, but when these are tested, it falls away. And we revert to more authoritarian and less democratic means. And so this is important because the notion of a class struggle is that it leads to a revolution and revolutions are defined not as a coup not as a palace revolution the genuine revolutions are defined as a change in the class that rules the state so a genuine revolution would replace the feudal class with the capitalist class and another one would replace the capitalist class with the working class the rest are just palace revolutions, coup d'etat, but not genuine revolutions. So the purpose of our struggle is to have a revolution that puts the working class in charge of the state apparatus. 
And where that has happened, as it did in the Soviet Union, it doesn't necessarily go smoothly. <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily end up any worse than what was before. So we have to be careful about the way we put it. So that's a precursor. So the question then is, is that, is that just there sitting on top of the discussion? So the question is, what is class? And I have to say, I've had some intriguing and entertaining debates about this over many years. One young man once said, in a recent <laughs> talk I gave to the unions, he said, my girlfriend, he came my heart and he said, my girlfriend says, if you be to university, you can't be working class. And I said, what happens if you drop out halfway through? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, are you then work, you're still working class if you leave just before your finals? I said, it's all nonsense. And this is something we have to take account of. And part of the argument, now I wish to divert slightly from some uh, um, Marxist interpretation of what is working class to do with the nature of exploitation and argue that it's primarily about a labour market. So I've come to this. I mean, basically, I don't know about you, but some people are obsessed with their ancestors, and they go into these things. Often when I go to local libraries looking for research into some obscure thing that happened in 1850, most of the other people in local libraries are looking for their ancestors. And I say, look, wait a minute. In 1900, 98% of the world's population were peasants. So the chances are, your relatives were peasants, you know, why are you interested, you know? Come on, guys, it's not that interesting. I mean, most of us would probably put our hands up. Certainly, my great-grandparents were peasants, you know? They weren't actually, but everyone called them peasants. <laughs> yes, so you're... How close are you to a peasant ancestry? We are generally marauders and pillagers. <laughs> well, okay. So you were aggressive peasants. Bandits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were bandit peasants. That's fine. And all he, so people were serfs or slaves. I mean, this is the the history of the world isn't that difficult. People were serfs or slaves, the vast majority. And so, really, the modern world, in my view, doesn't stem from some religious or political development. It stems from the abolition of serfdom and slavery. This is because. When you liberate the slaves, now I'd be absolutely hammered for ever saying, when you liberate the slaves. When the, lib the slaves liberated themselves, is the correct position, through slave uprisings in the West Indies, in the southern states, far more of it was from, you know, uprisings than ever from liberals in London, <laughs> abolishing it. What happens? And I'm always trying to get in sort of, I'm not an imaginative person, but I try to imagine I'm a slave on a southern plantation in America. I've had an appalling time of it. And some guy comes and says, you're free. <laughs> and you think, right, I can't read, I can't write, I've got no skills. I'm stuck in this bloody awful place in Mississippi or Texas. What does that mean? Said, what do you mean I'm free? To do what? Exactly, to starve to death because I've got no bloody means of support. I've got nothing to do. Don't liberate me, please, you know. And the same must have been with serfs, yeah? If you're in central Russia and the guy says, the Tsar's gone, you're free. What? I mean, most people in England before the First World War had never moved more than five miles from their place of birth. I mean, the First World War was... You don't know, where are we going? My like, God, you know, we're going to Kent, really? Well, oh, it's still the same, it's still not right. Most people haven't left more than five months. <laughs> ah! ah! And what you had to do, and this is the defining moment of, before that, there's no working class. This is the defining moment. I had to sell the only thing I own, which is my labour. This is it. This is the moment where the working class emerges. Because before that, there were no labour markets. Because there were not, people were not selling their labour to an employer. Once you have the liberation, of course there were some, but once you have this mass freedom and liberation, the slaves moved up into Chicago and it went into other jobs yeah? and other places looking for work. So firstly, people have always travelled the world and round the corner looking for work, haven't they? Always, because 
how do I make my living if I don't own land and I don't own capital? I am profitless. I only have my skills, a quantity of labor, my hours and a quality of my skills. That's all I've got. And I sell it, but like everything else, I sell it in a market. A lot of socialists are in a muddle about markets, right? Markets have nothing to do with capitalism. Okay, you have markets before capitalism, and you have to have markets after capitalism. They're just a device. They're just a device. They're not in and of itself. In fact, most capitalists don't want markets. They want monopolies. <laughs> They're not interested in competition, don't they? They just want a place where they can buy and sell, like the rest of us. So, labour market, that is, I, I know I'm going on a bit about that, but that seems to be the defining question. How you earn your living. Now, if we take that as the brute analysis. I have no choice but to sell my labour because the alternative is I have no income, because I don't have income called rent from owning land, and I don't have income called profit or dividends of interest from owning capital. I only have income which we call wages. That's it. So that means anybody who is in that position is a working class. So if I am a school teacher, as my big sister was for many years, a head teacher right around the corner, she's still working class because she has no alternative. If she doesn't do that, what's the alternative? She has no income, okay, benefits or whatever, but that's the reality. And that's no different from the bus driver or anybody else who's selling their labour. Yes, sir? I'm still going to be talking economically, don't you mean... Uh if we have no surplus. No, I'm not, I, I don't mean that. I don't mean, I'm coming on to that. But I don't mean that. That's, that's where I differ. Okay, so the question is, am I exploited? So there's two issues. The first issue is I'm arguing that the definition of working class, I'm arguing a very broad one, which I do believe is in Marx, in wage, labour and capital, which is shorter works. Okay, I do believe that, and I think that's it. That's the defining quality and characteristic. The question then arises of exploitation. So I'm arguing it doesn't matter what level of skill or education you have, it doesn't matter what sector you're in, it doesn't matter what gender, ethnicity, ability, blah, 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 none of that matters because we're all working class because we sell. Our That's what we have in common. And one of the sort of moments where I appreciated this with Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the Vietnamese Revolution, who was a pastry cook in colonial Indochina, where the French were the colonists. And on his trip, he was on a boat, he arrived in Algeria, where he met a Muslim. He was a Catholic. A Catholic from Indochina met a Muslim from North Africa, who was also a cook. And they got talking, apparently. And what did they have in common? What did they have in common? They were cooks who were selling their labor to French colonialists. And they decided this was more important than anything that divided them. So this is a dividing quality. Now, I often use the example of Darwinian theory of birds. Because when Marx died, Engels made a speech at his grave in which he said that Marx had discovered the laws of human society as Darwin had discovered the laws of natural society, of the natural world. So Marx and Darwin used the same dialectical methods to understand the way in which it worked. And for me, Darwin's analysis of birds is quite interesting. So you've got an ostrich, which is about eight foot tall, and runs, never flies never flies. You've got penguins, which as far as I know don't fly either, that swim. And you've got hummingbirds that are tiny and spend their entire life flying. And then you've got eagles. And you've got finches. Now Darwin said these are all birds. So we could, if we use that like for class, we can say you could be tall and short, man or woman, black, white, doesn't matter. <coughs> What do birds have in common makes them birds is their beak. That is, how do they survive? 
How do they make a living? And they make a living because they've all got a job. And workers make a living because they all sell their labour. And that's what they have in common. And one of the most important contributions we can make is to say that is more important than everything that divides us. And at this current moment in our history, this seems to me a rather important point to make, that it's what keeps us together in that class that is more important than what divides us. Now, I don't want to get <laughs> overly <laughs> it's boring about this, but a lot of people argue, look, I go to work, this is the classic Marxist position, and I work away, and I have wages, and the wages are less in value than the value I make for my boss. Yeah, simple. So I create value, labour theory of value, which by the way is not a Marxist theory, but was first espoused by uh, our friends from the Catholic Church way back in the 12th century, <coughs> and where they talk about if I shoot a deer and I cut it up and eat it, it's only when human labour is mixed with a wild animal that value is created. So it's not a uniquely Marxist position of labour theory of value, but the notion is working labour makes value. But that the wages I'm paying is less than the value, the difference is known as surplus value, and I take it, the boss takes it from me, and that's exploitation. And I can earn, in fact, one of the ironies is the more you earn, probably the more you're exploited. So if you earn a high wage working for the banking sector, you're probably, they make more profit out of you than if you were uh, earning a smaller wage. But people don't always see it like that. The word exploitation is used very loosely. But this is a technical sense, simply that the wages I receive are lower in value than the value I create, the difference being surplus. Marx referred to this as the expropriation of it, that's stolen <coughs> by the bosses through their power from workers, and this is then turned into profit. So that's where profit comes from. Now, there are several difficulties with this analysis. One is that not all surplus value is turned into profit. This is known as the realisation problem, which we can't go into. Secondly, and this is my favourite bit of the debate, because this is where I spent most of my research, what about state workers? So if I may work for the state, say as a nurse, I can't be exploited because there is no surplus value. But that has to be nonsense, doesn't it? Because are we saying state workers are not exploited, and if you're not exploited, you're not part of the working class, <clears throat> and if you're in the private sector, so a lot of Marxists for a long time have argued this, and they were quite wrong. And the reason they're wrong, and I had to explain this, <laughs> it's, the, it's the good example, it's the coal miners. So the coal miners in Britain from 1948 to about 1992 were in the public sector. So are we really saying those coal miners in 1991 were not exploited because of state? Then overnight they were privatised. Are we saying the poor sods who were still going down the line, <laughs> digging away, exactly the same pay, exactly the same everything, suddenly they are now exploited in part of the working class? So are we arguing that literally in one minute they're not workers because they're not exploited, and the next minute they are workers because they're... Now that's just nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. Now if it doesn't make any sense, therefore it can't be true, and therefore it must be the case that even if I work in the state sector where there is no profit, no surplus, I am still working class and I can still be exploited. So this is, has been for many years a difficulty amongst Marxist de people debating. I don't see, I don't wish it to be a difficulty, I just think the working class comes from the nature of the labour market. The fact that I have no choice but to sell my labour, otherwise I starve. Uh, okay, you may not literally starve, but the alternative to work is grim, and in many countries you will starve. I mean, I'm a visiting professor in Malawi, a poor country in Africa, and that's it. I mean, literally, if you don't work, you starve. So I've got no choice. It doesn't matter whether I'm a school teacher or agricultural worker or whatever. Does it? It doesn't matter. I have to go to work, and it's being forced into the market 
that determines the fact I'm exploited because I have no choice. If I get sacked, as I have several times, <laughs> I've been victimised rather than sacked <laughs> for my politics and my trade union activity. Well, I, my employer doesn't give a damn. They go, in fact, they're totally relieved. So for them, it doesn't matter, does it? But for me, it's life and death. I can't feed my eight, I have eight children. I can't feed my eight children. As you know, you already know the youngest. Ben, yeah? So it's completely uneven, isn't it? My need to work as an employee, as a worker, is life and death. The employer's need for me is not. Less trouble. <laughs> and less trouble to boot. So that's the argument. So the argument is that it doesn't matter whether you're public or private sector. Yeah, it's still, you're still working class. Okay, so is that, that's end of part one. <laughs> any, any questions at this point? Because this is crucial, isn't it? If we def our definition then determines the rest of how we move forward. Anyone wish to ask? Can I just ask you a question about the, what is the Marx definition of labor class exactly? For example, I am I'm a computer programmer. I don't do any hard work, but I go and I sell my, my brains, and my boss makes more money than I'm paid. Am I a working class? Yes. Okay, so what, are you employed or are you self employed? I don't know. I'm employed. Basically, I get my wages. Yeah, of course, you're, the answer is of course you're working class. Because <coughs> so, sorry, I don't normally check that. Why not? Why not? I mean, what, what was the definition from Marx about the labour class or working class? That is it. I've given it to you. Yeah. It's essentially about selling your labour, being forced to sell your labour, because the alternative is what? <coughs> if you weren't in work, what would you do? For some yes. Yes, so that's it. You're forced. Yeah. We have created a capitalist society which forces you, yeah. the masses, I'm sorry to call you one of the masses, yeah. but you're mad. Yeah. As part of the masses, you're yeah. forced to work because there are no alternatives for income. You don't own land, you don't own property. Now, it's possible to move from class to class. You could save up, buy someone else's house, become a landlord, buy shares, get given shares and so on. But of course, and you can go the other way. You can be a rich landlord, lose everything and have to go to work. We know that. But it's... Yeah. Objectively, that's your position. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're by hand or brain. Yeah. It doesn't matter the level of skill or the sector or so on. You know, you could argue, I, you know, and there is obviously, for many people at the moment, the question of self-employment or full self-employment. Because I'm arguing you have to be employed, you have to have a boss. And people say, well, what about the gig economy and people working on the cloud in all sorts of countries where you log on to it and you can you bid like a self-employed contractor what about what's the status well generally speaking these people i believe are part of the working class even though they're technically not under a contract of employment so the legal definitions of workers and employees in fact there's no legal definition of a worker it's an employee um doesn't match perfectly with an economic view but they wouldn't necessarily expect that so again, we had a situation where taxi drivers at one point in London were all self-employed, and then they all gave up being self-employed because the idiot Chancellor Exchequer, a man called Gordon Brown, changed the tax rules on self-employment, and if you became a director, an employed director of your company, you paid less tax. So 50,000 London taxi drivers went overnight from being self-employed <laughs> to being employees of their own company. I mean, it's just nonsense. And it's surely for legal and tax reasons, but from our point of view, from a social economic point of view, they're the same. So we mustn't get bogged down in the niceties of this. But this does impact, and your case impacts on the second half of my talk. Well, I need to drone on a bit longer. Uh, yes, sorry. A small question, and it relates to that one as well. No, I don't say small question, they're always the most dangerous. <laughs> I guess it's, is there a clear line towards 
fully into petty bourgeois class, and I'm thinking of <coughs> modern complexities, which you might come on to now to do with things like if you use Airbnb and you say I rent, I don't know if you can rent, but also have an Airbnb room and all these kind of variations. Okay, sure. I mean, the 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 notion is that the there's. Um, my understanding of petty bourgeois, which is normally people treat petty bourgeois co contempt culturally and politically, but the general thing is small business, that's what we're talking about. So it may well be that a lot of capitalists are small capitalists. Maybe one, you know, sole traders. I mean, certainly since the breakup of local authority building groups, most plumbers, electricians, God bless them, I have to say, without which <laughs> life would be miserable. Um, are self-employed or sole traders? So the question is, are they petty bourgeois because they now are small capitalists and they are not employed, they're not exploited in that sense, they pay different tax rates, and they develop a different consciousness, which is what we're coming on to. So certainly, uh, and in, this is one of the difficulties for British people when we try to look abroad, not that we want to, but when we have to look across the channel, um, <clears throat> to understand that, for instance, in France, that class, that petty bourgeois class, particularly farmers, is far bigger than in the UK. Mm. So they're not naturally part of the working class. Now, we'll end, when I finally get there, is this notion of alliances, that the working class can form alliances with other class groups, obviously, with petty bourgeois or others, uh, on particular issues at certain times. And we shouldn't ignore that. And John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, has constantly, I mean, he doesn't want to, but at the end of most of his speeches, he adds on something about small business and says, and by the way, Labour government will be the friends of small business. Because he's trying to say, look, your income partly depends on the income of the working class. If we can increase the income and job security of the working class, they'll spend more on your shops and your businesses, and therefore it is in your interest. But naturally, small shopkeepers, uh, the petty bourgeois, are the allies of the right wing. In France, they were called Pugilists. They were, you know, the, and in Britain, we had a party called the National Union of Small Shopkeepers, which was a far right party. And so, the, traditionally, they're anti tax. This is the Trump base in America, they're anti tax, anti state interference, anti red tape. They hate the unions because they see the trade unions as pushing up wages uh, to undeserving workers while they work 24-7 on their shops and therefore they should be paid better, blah, blah, yes? Is that the, yeah, so, and of course, again, sorry, just to end that, in America, in the boom, thousands, literally tens of thousands of car workers give up their job as car workers and set up as self-employed car mechanics in the good year times, mm -hmm. and then when the crush comes, they give up because they can't make a living and go back to being car workers. Mm -hmm. So there is, in some countries, in some sectors, quite a lot of flip-flopping, and this does impact on their consciousness of political parties. Sorry. Just clarification. Uh, the people who are shop owners using their own labor solely, not using other people's Labor. Is there a difference between the people who are using other people's labor and or just use their own? No. No. Okay. Whether okay. you're uh, because a lot of big shopkeepers started as small shopkeepers, <laughs> and that's one of the things about the history of companies and businesses. They may start as a sole trader with their family, and then they employ somebody, and then somebody else, and then they end up as same. <coughs> Yeah, but what about the market stalls and the man, people who work on the markets? <laughs> well, we're getting... Like an East Standard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> we're getting to the point where... <laughs> Sorry. And Marx himself argued, and a lot of Marxists, uh, particularly the famous philosopher Jerry Cohen, argued that we can talk quite clearly about this, but it doesn't mean we can easily put everybody in a clear slot. So it's easier to talk as I am. But you can't always say that person fits there or fits there or fits there because it's, it's fluid. Technically, uh, if they're operating legally, yes. <laughs> which is unusual, <laughs> which would be unusual, they 
uh, it, one of the difficulties with them is, and others, is whether this is their sole source of income. So some people work as, say, plumbers during the week, and then market traders at the weekend. And so they would have, you know, they would both be workers, and they would be uh, petty bourgeois stallholders. And which way they would go, I don't know. I mean, it's a lot, it's fluid. Something. Yeah, you see, I'd like to give an uh, example of it. When I was a chair of fixed style branch of uh, PNG in search shops in the 1990s, we organized many uh, strikes for the waiting and working conditions. And uh, my shop stewards, they were very successful actually, they organized very well, but they became a leaders as well. When, we, if, when the, the strikes are finished, a few years later, they became a function of this Yeah, yeah. And here we are, pretty, pretty it's, it's, it's an oddity. I mean, I, to parallel that, I mean, <coughs> I did a lot of work with the miners in the 1980s and 1990s, National Union Mine Workers. And a lot of my friends in the, in the Mine Workers Union, when the mine shut, received substantial redundancy. I mean, you know. It was substantial. And they used to come and say, well, what am I going to do, Roger? You know, I said, I don't know. And what did they do? They bought newsagent shops, they bought off-license shops, they bought a lot of bought taxis firms. So they went from being almost the shock troops of the British Trade Union movement, the NUN, the miners, to being shop owners and people. I have to say, sadly, most of them were appallingly bad at business and went bust. <laughs> And lost all their money and went back to work in something else to, soon after. In fact, our biggest local taxi firm, yeah, uh, yeah they was owned, is owned by one of the miners was very good. So he, all the other went bust. So he then employed all these other ex miners. So they went back to being workers and taxi drivers. But he became a, a capitalist. However, and this is where we're coming on to, he was the most left wing. <laughs> Even after he became rich, nothing is straightforward. If it was, uh, you know, uh, we wouldn't need to be here. Is that it? So that's fine. Yeah. So there's complications, and particularly UK. Shall, shall so we have the second, second section? I might be a little bit long. Is it, is it long question list? time? Okay. I, yeah. Well, anyway, this, I mean, it's fairly obvious where we're heading now. So the question is. So once we've defined the working class, can we then define working class interests? Is this, and this is quite interesting, this is the sort of four or five Ps of, that I, you as a politics professor will know better than me, but you know, you have, you start with principles, yeah? then you have programs, then you have yeah, policies, and then you have practices. So you have all the Ps, because so what we're saying is, a working class, I mean, obviously a working class party, should represent working class interests. Now, those of you who are familiar with British Labour history will know that the lament of, in Britain is that Labour governments come in on a principal set of programmes, the two first P's, around working class interests higher wages, better job security, more workers' rights, more stuff on health, welfare, blah, blah, yeah. But that they then develop policies that also appear to be in the interest of working class, but when it comes to the practice, some of it happens and some of it doesn't. And we then get disillusioned, and as Ralph Miliband, the famous Marxist, wrote in 1972 in his book, the state and capitalist society said so the problem is when you get weak labour governments or social democratic governments, they fail and the working class becomes more and more disillusioned. And he argued in 1972 that after the collapse of each weak social democratic government, you get more and more right wing governments because the workers would react against the betrayal and against the failure. And so they would turn to the right. And each time, the right would become more strident. And that's the Trump, the Johnson. Yeah, that's what we're seeing in a lot of countries. So the argument is, is there something as objective? Are there common policies? And I have to say, 
if you're leading the Labour Party today or the Social Democrats in other countries, it is very difficult to stitch together a program that meets the interests of all sections of the working class. Because although we've agreed that there's this fundamental basic working class, there's clear differences. And these differences show up in different interests. So for some groups, some issues are more important than others. So actually to have a party political program that attracts a wide support because it touches on everybody's interests, while at the same time advancing the general interests of the class, is quite difficult. And we see that. We see that in bitter debate and contestation of what issues matter and where in the pecking order they should come with the NHS, which is the notion is everybody uses the NHS, not everyone uses the education system, yeah? not everybody uses uh, the uh, army and police, but everybody uses the NHS, so this is the common denominator we push forward. So the question is, how do we define class interests, how do they emerge? And this is really quite difficult, and in this we need to be very careful. Because while it's this objective, more, you know, we can say that everyone gets a pay rise, <laughs> but it's not enough. Those of you familiar with the great work, The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist, written by a building worker in 1910 or 11, um, where he's, the building workers are clearly exploited, but they also don't like the fact that they're exploiting the customers by watering down the paint and so on. And, he explains to what he calls the great money trick, where he shows that even if workers' wages go up, the capitalists end up pocketing it all. So in the end, it doesn't matter. Your wages go up, but you're still at the bottom. And he calls this the great money trick. And that's uh, brilliantly exposed in that way. And so the question is, how do we do that? Now, I'm not sure, but I'm tempted by um, the famous academic at Cambridge, Amrachet at Sen, who is a professor of philosophy and economics and a Nobel Prize winner. And he wrote a book a few years ago called The Idea of Justice. And he's obviously of Indian origin. He's lived in England for a long time. And he combines Asian, African, and European philosophy and history to try to get at some sense of it. And he argues that the only way to get this is through a what he calls a public conversation. Now, I don't want to get soppy and sociological on us, you know, by saying all we need to do is talk, 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 because <laughs> we don't believe that. But there's a sense in which it is important that all voices are heard and that all voices are treated with respect, which has not always been the case on the left or in the Labour movement. I've been at meetings, I'm sure, but all of you have been in meetings where some voices have been ignored or dissent has been a push to one side, and that's a mistake. He's arguing we have to reach an agreement through proper listening and hearing and having forums where the debate can take place freely. And of course, this is a big issue at the moment. People are shouting all the time about no platform for fascists, freedom of speech, you know, what is acceptable or not, can we shut down things, pull down this statue and put up another, yeah? No, even Kipling. Uh, has been defaced. Kipling's just been defaced. So it's difficult, isn't it? So I'm not arguing that that's straightforward, but it's one of our questions for us, the movement today, is how do we go further around an objective definition of class interests? Now, obviously, that's linked to the question of class consciousness. And here we are in a very difficult area because. Consciousness must be to do with being aware of your interests. So working class conservatives are a famous, what statisticians would call an outlier <laughs> in British political history. Why would the people of Stoke-on-Trent, which is a what people would call a post-industrial town, labour for 50 years, have now elected a Tory MP for South Stoke, who I know, who's an obnoxious little uh, man, I mean far right, ignorant and very, very snotty. And they elected him, not that any of them knew him. He used to be my student. Yes, I know. We taught him. Well, how did you find him? He was very polite. Yes, I have to say he's very polite. 
when he's making sure that you lose your job. <laughs> he's a baby face assassin. So <laughs> he what he so we have a work, a downtrodden, no way round it, a downtrodden working class in Stoke Town have voted in a Conservative. Now Marx called this false consciousness. That people were confused, if you like. And people like Gramsci and others and Raymond Williams in Britain in the 50s sought to explain through cultural uh, means how this comes about. How you believe that the monarchy is a good thing. How you believe that the rich deserve to be rich. Yeah? How you believe that unemployment is the fault of the unemployed. How you believe that immigration is causing all these problems. That apparently we didn't have violent crime before we had immigrants. I always thought it was the other way around. <laughs> the British were famously violent, and immigrants mainly calmed us down. <laughs> but, you know, this is a question. And um, Gramsci explained it through religion, through media, through education, through all these me methods of controlling information and interpretation, of which the most pernicious is the divide and rule. This is the thing in which I have to say, I'm proud to be British. We excel and have throughout our imperial years in dividing and ruling, of turning people against each other on the smallest pretext in order to make sure they don't unite against us. And horror, it, it, the horrible thing is it's so successful, isn't it? It's just so successful. You only have to read the papers, turn on the telly, listen to conversations on the bus, or the tube, don't you? And you can hear people saying, oh, you know, oh, it's this group, it's that group. What about the rich? <laughs> no, it's never them. Yeah? So divide and rule is a classic false consciousness where you turn people's attention away from your common enemy towards each other. And it is, it's remarkable. And it's remarkably successful down the years. You would have thought maybe people would learn the lesson that all it ends up with is that we stay poor and the others, capitalist class, grow stronger and richer. We do have counter-propaganda and counter-case. So we have, what's it called? Fat Cat Monday, is it? The third day of the year, 3rd of January, the richest executives in Britain have already earned more than the rest of us for the year. It's called Fat Cat, whatever, yeah? Fat Cat Day. So we have that. We have examples and outbursts of unity and so on. But these are just like a firework, really. They illuminate the sky and then it goes dark again. So consciousness is important. And the reason it becomes more important is twofold. Firstly, the theoretical model that Marx said the dialectical materialist model. This is fundamental to all Marxists, which is that it is people's experience, what he called being, that determines their consciousness. Their experience of life determines, and not their ideas that determine their existence. So he argued for the premise of material world, that what we experience is the dominant driving force of our intellectual understanding. And this was very clearly explained to me by one of the leaders of the American Communist Party, who I went to hear speak, where he was talking about slavery. And he said, look, it's slavery that breeds racism, not racism that breeds slavery. He said they weren't racists who brought the slaves over and said, right, you're black African slaves, you're less important than us, we're going to enslave you. It was the other way around. It was the economic need to have this labour. Once you had slaves, you then had to argue they were less than you in order to justify the treatment. So it's the slavery that drives the racism, not the racism that creates the slavery. And that's a vivid example of what Marx meant by dialectical materialism. And it's in this that gives us the ability to fight back. Because whatever is said, 
in the propaganda sphere, whatever false consciousness spreads, whatever what they now call fake news, although why people think it's true. What's new about fake news? I mean, what's new? I mean, I read the Bible the other day. <laughs> no, I did. I was reading. I had to read a passage about the Good Samaritan. That's pretty fake news, I think. Quite a bit of it. Lazarus, particularly, I'm not sure about coming back from the dead, to be honest. I mean, that was written some years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, that alone, if you read uh, Caesar's account of his conquest of Britain, which was 2,000 years ago, I think he exaggerated a bit about his role. Do you remember that bit where he says, and the great general, well, that was him, he was talking about himself, won the battle. So the general won the battle. So Caesar was giving us quite a bit of fake news 2,000 years ago. But it's all part of that, isn't it? So the notion is that what we believe, and this is where the hope comes in, is that the endless day-to-day -day experiences prevail. Right? Not always in the short term and not always immediately apparent. Now Lenin was quite, and to some extent borrowing from the French historian to Tocqueville, was a little bit unclear about how that would work because de Tocqueville, if you remember, argued when they were saying why was the French Revolution when it was, because five years before the French Revolution, the material condition of the workers and the peasants was much worse. It was terrible. And it's only when it started getting better do you have revolution. So Lenin referred to this as routinization of daily life, in which he argued that the difficulty we have is that it's so grinding, what Dickens called the drudge day. Yeah? The day after drudge. Day after day of work is drudge. You're too tired to think, you're too tired to do anything. You're too frustrated, fed up, alienated, exploited. It's just too much to go to a bloody meeting on a Friday night, let alone <laughs> rise up in a general strike or <laughs> go on a riot. And so there are voices that say, although daily experience is clearly difficult and hard for people, and they can compare it and contrast it to the life of the luxury of the super rich, it still doesn't generate the consciousness because people are just too tired. And that actually it's during periods of relative prosperity that people are more likely to become class conscious because they can see ah, things are getting better, maybe they could be better still through redistribution. So this is another part of our argument that Marxist, communist, socialists have to fight for consciousness. And class consciousness rarely comes by itself. It normally is preceded by some sort of trade consciousness, some awareness that at least we have common ground with our fellow employees. So when you look around in your office, factory, I don't know how many people you work with, nobody. Uh, when you look in the mirror, when you look at the mirror home and say, ah, oh, my comrade, <laughs> my one and only comrade, you know, the, the, the notion is that in that, yeah, moment I realised that my fellow workers and I have something in common. So it starts from a basic trade consciousness that builds then into a class consciousness. So that brings us to struggle. <laughs> because as we say, you know, I think as Lenin, again I keep quoting Lenin, I quoted this at a conference a few years ago in, in Lima in Peru, uh, Lenin's famous quote that, you know, theory, you know, quote, that practice without theory is blind, but theory without practice is useless. And I ended my talk, and this American woman came out and gave me a huge hug. She said, I've not heard anyone quote Lenin for 10 years. <laughs> Thank you so much, she said. <laughs> That's how bad academic debate has become, that these people are not allowed to be mentioned. So that's part of the thing. It's no good talking about it. It's useless, theory without practice. So we need practice, but practice informed by theory. And of course, when we come to struggle, we see organised and unorganised struggle. So unorganised struggles, some come, sometimes there was a group, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, called uh, UK Uncut. They uh, went in and sat in shops. And I met the leader of it, and she, she was fantastic. I mean, just fantastic. <laughs> just full of 
energy, ideas, and they stormed into Tesco or whatever it was and sat down and just disrupted everything. And this was, look, these are exploitative, they exploit the suppliers, they exploit the supply chain people, they exploit everybody, let's show them. And it was to got huge publicity. And then we had the uh, Occupy movement uh, in uh, Wall Street in New York and in St. Paul's in London. So these are spontaneous groups who demonstrate in an unorganized way on a particular single issue. But the argument is that the points they raise are points that show the nature of our society. That it is deeply exploitative, it's shameless in its ways in which inequality is treated as an inevitable consequence of humanity and not as a result of the capitalist system. So we have this unorganized group and the organized bit, the trade unions, the Labour Party, Communist Party and others, are sometimes a little nervous of these people. So the trade unions, uh, when I share platforms with them, are ambiguous. Some are okay with them, some think they're a nuisance. And for instance, the other day when the climate people climbed on the London trains, not only did the passengers go crazy, but the railway unions, who completely support the climate change activists, said this is not right. This is the wrong thing to do, because you're messing up with our members. And I was doing some work with the unions at Heathrow, the airport, and one of the groups I was dealing with are the security people who belong to the union. Interestingly, the security people themselves belong to Unite, TNG, but the managers belong to a civil service union, the PCS, so that's always fun when the unions aren't quite singing from the same sheet. And they were concerned. Now, their local MP is John McDonnell, who's the shadow chancellor, who's a very fierce environmentalist. And he's against the expansion of Heathrow Airport, even though half of his constituents work there. So he's, and he said he would run onto the tarmac and disrupt it. And the union people went mad and said, right, it's our job to pull you off. What do you want us to do? If we don't pull you off, we're going to be sacked. Hmm? So don't, please don't do that type of demonstration. So the thing with unorganized is it's wonderful, it's uplifting, and it may bring people into struggle who previously have not been involved. But it may also sometimes go wrong yeah, and rub up against the organized. Now, the organized is primarily the trade unions, obviously, the political parties, and some long-standing pressure groups. And I'm a particular fan, being rather old and boring, of organized <laughs> uh, struggle rather than disorganised struggle. I realise that's not always appropriate, but in the UK particularly, I think is appropriate. So the notion is that you, the major struggle of the working class is through the working class organisations, of which the main expression in the UK are the trade unions. So the trade unions, even in decline, still represent an important part. In the private sector, the numbers are very small now in the UK, but it doesn't matter because they are still strong in certain key sectors. The most obvious is transport. So they're still strong on the railways, in the airports, oh, yeah. and the fire unions. So transport, the thing about transport is, in this country, you go on strike one day, and you cause, as you know, the most enormous amount of havoc. Don't you? So for, if I'm a car worker, I might have to go on strike for two or three weeks before it has an impact, because they've already got a supply of cars, haven't they? But if I'm a, a BA pilot or a train driver, I go on strike one day, the disruption is massive. So, and this is not just unique to the UK, many countries, Japan, Pakistan, transport workers are amongst the most militant in the <coughs> private sector or in some cases the public sector. So organized trade unions are still very effective. Now, what does it mean when you take, you're well organized? What does it mean? Besides the obvious nuts and bolts of having branches, having <coughs> activists, having education and so on, what it means is that you have countervailing power. So we come to the end, in a sense it's about power, isn't it? 
You can so stop your employer, in my terms as a labour economist, I control the supply of labour to my boss for that day. Who controls the supply of labour? Normally it's the employer, but for that day I'm on strike, I'm controlling it, nobody goes to work. So it's an economic phenomenon, but with clear political issues. And one of the issues is around consciousness, because when you go on strike, and many people go on strike, I mean mainly in this country it's white collar workers, they see a side of the employer, of the newspapers, and of the government that they don't see normally. So you mentioned the firefighters. In 2002, the Fire Brigades Union went on strike. National strike, very unusual, over pay. I was involved in the disputes. And I'm not asking you to buy but I did write the book on it <laughs> about the dispute. And I was working daily with the General Secretary. Andy Gilchrist, and I was actually interviewing him while he was leading the strike, which was quite stressful for him. It wasn't stressful for me, but it was definitely stressful for him. And in that moment, you could see it, because you had a Labour government who announced that these were the most evil people on the planet, that they were, if we pay the firefighters more, then God help us, we'll have to pay the nurses more. You know, what a terrible evil that would be. So they were saying, we can't give you more because you've destroyed the economy. Apparently the firefighters are going to destroy the economy. They're going to destroy the entire public sector wage structure. And of course, the difficulty they had with firefighters is firefighters are very popular, <laughs> needless to say. So they had this thing about one of the quotes from the First World War. These were lions led by donkeys. So they decided they couldn't attack firefighters, so they attacked the leadership. They said that trade union leaders were donkeys who were misleading them, they were all communists and ne'er-do-wells and revolutionaries and so on. So they tried to split the members from the leaders. But the problem with the Fire Brigades Union, it's difficult to do it because all the elected leaders are firefighters. None of them, none are appointed bureaucrats. They all were, and Andy Cool Chris was, an ordinary firefighter in Luton before he got elected. So it was difficult to do that. But what they saw was the state attacking them, police harassing them, secret police spying on them, the media attacking them, the government attacking them. Who was coming to their support? Only other trade unionists. So this raised consciousness. This made them aware that going on strike for wages was more than going on strike for wages. It's what I refer to in that book and others as the Oliver Twist moment. You remember Oliver? I mean, he's, I mean this, is, this is poignant. He's a starving little boy. And there are these guys who are all rather well fed. And behind them is a feast. I mean, literally more food than they could ever eat in a week. And Oliver says, can I have more? He's not asking for the feast. He's not asking for the leg of lamb behind him. He's just asking a bit more porridge. Now, why... So firstly, if you ask for more, that's all trade unions ever do, isn't it? Why? They didn't just say no. They threw him out of the orphanage and sold him, sold him to an undertaker. Why such violent and vicious punishment for a starving lad asking for more? Because he was challenging their decision making. He was saying, you've decided to give me not enough and I want more. So I'm challenging your decision. Now if I just challenge your decision, I challenge everything. Your judgment, the distribution, the entire authority that goes behind it. So a simple economic question, can I have more, leads to a violent attack on you because you're saying you know better about the economics of feeding people. You know why you should have it. So it changed everything. The moral, political, yeah, basis upon which society functions. So they were quite right to beat him and throw him down because he was a dangerous communist revolutionary. <laughs> as, as Dickens intended. <laughs> I'm sure Dickens, you know, was there. A comrade. <laughs> Not quite, but you know. So that's what was happening. So, but 
people watching and people listening. And to some people, that was the end of the Blair government. Because at that moment, Blair was exposed. He actually wrote an editorial in the Sun newspaper attacking the firefighters. And suddenly a lot of people, not everybody, saw that this was not a Labour leader worthy of the name. So struggle reveals things. It can change consciousness. Sometimes it just happens and goes away. So that strike did not lead, despite my endless promises on all those interviews I did. I kept saying, yes, yes, it's a strike way, it's a strike way. Uh, it didn't materialise. It didn't lead to anything more. But it did change people's attitudes. And even now I come across union officials in other unions who were firefighters during that dispute. So forever they remember and they've taken that elsewhere. So, ah, it's difficult. What is the relationship? When we look around the world and we look at rioting in Hong Kong, are these class warriors? Yes, they're capitalist class warriors. <laughs> they want more capitalism. <laughs> they want to be like America as they keep waving the American flag and calling for Trump. Then we see the, so they're not poor. Then we see the people in Barcelona. What is it? What is their consciousness? Do we support them or do we say no? You should identify as Spanish workers, not as Catalonian. This is the old thing. When I talk to the Scottish nationalists, Scottish workers, I say, well, you're siding with Scottish capitalists. Who are the two biggest funders of Scottish Nationalist Party? Remember, in politics, always look for the money. Well, one is Souter, the man who owns the coach and train companies, is one of the most vicious anti-union firms in the country. And the other is the couple who won the lottery and who are far-right nationalists. So you've got two... They're, they're, who gives Scottish Nationalist Party money? Not workers. Not workers. So what... Do we support nationalist movements? Do we support the Catalan? Do we support Hong Kong secessionists? So sometimes we don't know. <laughs> it's difficult to unpick the class. And that brings us to the final point that I wish to make, which is the balance of class forces. Because the question is, where do we put our efforts? Certainly in the UK, the left is ever present. It's amazing. You can go to small towns, villages, and you will find left-wingers, left-wing activists. But if we add them all up, <laughs> they're not that large. And a lot of people say, well, it's no point. No point. I mean, some of my friends are left in Britain because they said there's no point. The British working class are forever right, reactionary. There's no point in fighting on. And they said the balance of class forces is too great. That the imperial heritage from, you know, from the British Empire, the heritage is too big that the working class are too used to living off the residual monies from empire, that they will never become uh, socialists. They, so the balance of class forces is against us. And so what do we do? Well, I know it's odd, but I was rereading Milton's Paradise Lost. I'm, I'm writing a report, <coughs> sorry, on the Ministry of Defence. And uh, they let me into these barracks and things, it's quite entertaining. Anyway, I mean, they just let you in. And one guy said, computer system's down, you just better come in. They didn't even check on me. Anyway, and one of the things is, of course, you get into the debate about what's the purpose of the army and so on. And I re was rereading, and one, one of the things about Paradise Lost gives us a clue to this. Because remember what happened. Satan's up there with God. Everyone's fine. Satan decides that God's got a little bit lazy, incompetent. I mean, this is a familiar story, isn't it? <laughs> lazy, incompetent. And so he challenges God, and God throws Satan his followers down into hell. And they wake up, and you know, okay, well, guess what they said? It's hell here. You know? <laughs> and they, but then you get probably the greatest piece of poetry ever written in the world, because not only is it wonderful, but it sums up virtually all politics. What he says is, what do we do? I mean, we're in hell, for God's sake. What do we do? 
And he goes through it. He goes through the argument. The first guy is the adventurer. He says, don't be stupid. We can fight our way and we can throw God off his throne. No problems, Gatna. And we've heard that here often enough. Let's just get out on the streets, call a drone strike, overthrow the bastards. These are the adventurists, aren't they? People who think they can win. So he argues his case. And his... Then you have the defeatists. It's not that bad in hell. You know, I think I could grow a few veg down there. There's no point, there's nothing we can do. God is far too, you know, you hear this all the time. Capitalism is too strong, it's too entrenched. We can't do anything. We might as well just get on with our lives. So you've got the defeatists, you've got the adventurists, yes? You've got the impossibilists. Every strand of left-wing philosophy is there. You should try to sell it. Yeah? You should try to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> tactics, tactics, tactics. And then the devil comes up, and I'm not suggesting we are the devil in this story, and says, we can't overthrow him, but we can undermine him. We can undermine him. We can't get out as ourselves, but we can get out in disguise. So if we disguise ourselves as snakes, serpents, and we get Eve to eat the apple, then remember the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve live forever. This is God's creation. God's proud work. God's greatest thing was to make Adam and Eve forever. She eats the apple. Mortality. God's greatest creation, humankind, dies. And that corruption of the body and the soul is the devil's revenge. So, what do we do? That is the most brilliant analysis of the balance of forces. What can God do, what God can't do, what can we do, what we can't do, what's possible, what's not impossible, what's practical, what's not practical. And there it's all in paradise lost for us all to read. So that's where we are. That's where we are today. And the question is, where do we put our efforts? Do we all go back into our trade unions and redouble the efforts? One argument was that if we all have left-wing leaders, we'll be fine. Well, most of the trade unions in Britain have left-wing leaders now. Never had more left-wing leaders, never had more women leaders. Is it enough? <laughs> so that's one thing. Do we more or less say, that's a dead end, let's throw our weight behind the spontaneous Occupy movement, climate change movements, all these other movements? Do we throw our weight behind the regenerated Labour Party with Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and throw all, all the dice a rolled on a Corbyn government. You know, where, how do we change the balance of forces? Where do we put our limited resources? So that's the question. I don't know. That's it. That's enough. More than enough. Thanks so much. Uh, shall we have five minutes or ten minutes break? Yeah. <laughs> what do you have to break for? Breaks for <laughs> weaklings. People going. Yeah. I mean, when well, you're talking about trade unions, I mean, is it more a transformation of the political nature of trade unions than it is kind? Because with the one of the problems that the working class has is the rise of corporations. And uh, you did a really great term with Paradise Lost by Earl Silver. Was that, uh, you know, when I was studying this during my last year, I was uh, studying political and social theory. I was reading up a little bit on um, uh, Machiavelli. Um, and one of the curious so things... <laughs> one of the curious things about Machiavelli and this was about feminism, and it was a, talking about virtue. And do you think that the working class has to fundamentally think about, because of the rise of um, populism and there's a lot of turmoil, just as was in Machiavelli's time, do you think that trade unionism needs to return to a theme of virtue? Well, it's a terrific question, obviously. I mean, most people remember Machiavelli for his 
his major uh, analysis of state power, because obviously he's writing at the time of the emergence of the first city-states, later nation-states, and he comes up, I mean, it's not unique to Machiavelli, because he's quoting Aristotle, obviously, about state power being a mixture of consent and coercion. So this is where the consent is to do with consciousness. This is why uh, European Marxists, including Lenin and Marx himself, were very use Machiavelli a lot because of his analysis of state power. And the notion is that coercion is very much around how can I coerce unless I get into people's minds ideologically and in terms of cultural norms. So of which feminism, obviously, without my wishing to enter the minefield and being blown up at every crystal turn, in some forms is clearly a counter hegemonic attempt to uh, yeah, you know, get away from certain dominant themes, quite rightly, and reconstruct the way in which we think about class and identity. So one thing I didn't discuss, because there's limits, is of course identity politics, which in many ways, is, it, I mean, it is a dialectical dilemma, but in many ways identity politics is both a good and a bad thing, because we would argue in favour of identity politics, in favour of working class identity. <laughs> However, sub-identities can make it harder to forge a working class unity because we can say I am first and foremost an old man which I am and sod the rest of you my interests are not your interests so I can abandon any notion of working class unity in pursuit of my own identity and that can be counterproductive on the other hand we are arguing for identity politics but the identity of a working class and it's interesting in the Lebanon just this week, where they interviewed the people on the streets, and they were saying this is the first time for a long time that Lebanese people of all religion, of all genders, of all categories have come together in this, and they were conscious of the importance. Now, what becomes of it in terms of, I don't know, but your notion of virtue is rather more complicated, obviously, as you well know, because in some respects, Marx would argue that he was, and Marxists would argue that he was mainstream in European philosophical work. After all, he did his PhD on Greek philosophy in Germany. So he would say he was mainstream. And concepts such as the virtuous person, which goes, as I say, Machiavelli borrowing from earlier works, is very much around that idea of goodness of virtue being, as I was saying when I was reading the Bible, the good Samaritan. This notion that everybody is my neighbour. So the virtuous person is someone who understands, it's not about being personally honest, it's about understanding my relationship with others and being one who helps and supports. So it's got elements of a community-based working class philosophy but it can be misused as well to uh, individualise, which is one of the most damaging parts of the collective world which we inhabit. Because our view is it has to be collective action. It can't be individual acts of bravery or individual acts of rebellion. We're not in favour of martyrs. Right? We're in favour of collective sustained action. So virtue would be, in our view, someone who is willing to sort of take, as musicians say, take the ego out of performance. When I'm a soprano singing, I mustn't be me. I'm simply the voice of the composer for the audience. So in that sense, virtue has got to be where I actually push down my personal identity in order to support the collective needs of others. But that's one interpretation, as you're aware. I'm not arguing it's the only interpretation. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Now your secondary linked point was the problem of the big corporation. And as you know, there are writers, not least to write for that awful rag called The Guardian, which is my most hated paper of all. Mine too. <laughs> I, can't, I just can't stand it. You know, some of my best friends are journalists of The Guardian. But I still hate it. But the, th the thing is that 
they always talk about, they talk about a corporate world elite who no longer have a country. So they want to make us believe that these people don't have a country, they're not loyal to anything, that they are outside state control, and therefore they're outside our control. Now, if we say that, then we have lost. That is the ultimate defeatist position, where we posit a future society in which multinational corporations are outside any regulatory framework, any control whatsoever, and therefore outside working class. Now, and therefore, we will always be exploited by our friend Bezos at Amazon, right? Because we can't reach them. Now, I think that's a defeatist position. I also think it's inaccurate. Whatever they say, you know, whatever Gates says about Microsoft, he's still got to put his feet somewhere. They're not disembodied spirits yet. They're still people who own capital. Capital is still registered in places. They are still humans who inherit space, a place, and so they are not beyond regulatory control. They are beyond the regulatory control of the current political leadership because they don't want to regulate. But they're not beyond our control. So I don't accept that view of a corporate super elite who spend one week in, you know, Bahamas and another week somewhere else and another week somewhere else. I know they do spend that time. That doesn't mean they can't be captured. So I don't accept that notion of the all-power corporation. Also, sorry, just to find out, I mean, one of Marx's things was about the dynamics of the capitalist economy. And if you remember, and we know this from 2008, that he argued that there would be periodic collapses because the system is inherently unstable. And that corporations would grow, but they would also collapse. Right? And we've seen this. Some of the biggest corporations in the world collapse overnight. So they're, they're not as all-powerful and as almighty as they appear to be. And we should see them for what they are, that they grow and they fall. Now, in my view, Volkswagen will fall soon, after all the scandals and so on, because the Americans are bringing multi-billion dollar lawsuits against them, which will bankrupt them. Boeing might well go under after this current thing. So they do go under. And sometimes, in some countries, they go to jail. Not often. Bizarrely, they're more likely to go to jail in America than in Europe. Americans are fiercer against their corporate ill-doers than the Europeans. Interesting, isn't it? It was the Americans who arrested the football bosses. And that's because there's still a streak of that American puritanism. Zealots, what we used to be we called public sector zealots, still exist in America. And they don't tend to exist so much in Europe. It's interesting. Another contradiction that Marx would have appreciated. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been a student of Marx for a long time. Uh, was it been as long as yourself? <laughs> uh, I expect we've um, read the same stuff, but I have to say I've come to some very different conclusions. But my understanding of um, uh, historical materialism, what um, Engels later called scientific socialism, which is the condition of humankind's survival on Earth until its natural end. And it's our increasing awareness of that natural end that empowers us to prevent its premature occurrence uh, as it is destroyed by those people who only want to exploit um, uh, the products of nature for their selfish uh, consumption uh, when we have to learn, if we're going to survive until then, uh, that we must learn to share it uh, amicably uh, and uh, not only that, but enjoy its uh, convivial recreation. Um, uh, and that, uh, and it wasn't even Marx that said, you know, that was, that was um, uh, Kant's conception of, um, uh, uh, I've forgotten the name of his books, but, uh, you know, the, well, first of all, the, the groundwork for all human morality is the, is the morality that we've learned from other species that, that pre-existed, you know, intelligent species that, that, that from which we evolved and which we must cultivate if, we, if we're to survive and live uh, together with. Um, uh, and then, and Hegel says, well, yeah, of course I go along with that, but the trouble is these religious people, they don't, you know, they're so indoctrinated that they, they, they will not throw off their, um, self, their, their selfish leaders, uh, and therefore we liberals, you know, we support Napoleon and, you know, the French Revolution and, and, and therefore the impending German Revolution to use military force and 
uh, to establish the German state, as the French established theirs. And, uh, and, and then uh, Feuerbach said, well, that ain't going to work, uh, because otherwise they'll just carry on destroying, you know, the working class will think, we're winning now by using violence. <coughs> Uh, 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 and the German section of the, of the Second International, which was then the most powerful, it just went along with big Bismarck's plan for colonial wars and, um, you know, for the colonization of, a, of Africa and preparation for, for military struggle against the British Empire, which was bound to lose. And, and, uh, and then when the, most people who called themselves Marxists said, we need war. Which, you know, then left Lenin and Luxembourg and Liefnet with one hell of a bloody problem. Um, and we're still living with, you know, it's that bit that hasn't been resolved. Um, uh, uh, and the division within the, uh, the Marxist movement, or whatever those people who call themselves Marxist, about what, you know, the, what happened in the Soviet Union? That was, you know, that was the working class. Um, the work, you know, that was the working class taking power. We, we were told that it was the working class that's taking power in China. Well, it doesn't look like it to me, and I don't think it does to most people over here who think, well, yeah, we, we need a bit more of that. Um, and so, you know, just to see if I can draw this to some sort of confusion, in, in the um, uh, London House Centre, uh, we just say, look, the trade union movement, it's your job to defend your members and your families' mem members Come hell or high water, because if you allow your integrity, your your unity to be, to be broken, uh, they will win. Now, the, the, the position of the British trade union movement is completely different from the position of the trade union movement in Europe, in America, and also in China and uh, everywhere else. Because here, sorry, in, in Europe, the trade unions were built by social democrats. And so the, the, the trade unions were the creatures of the Social Democrats. Here, the trade unions say to the, the MPs, when they remember, you're supposed to be serving us. That's what Len McCluskey said. Put up somebody we can believe in, and we'll back you, following Blair. So I think, uh, 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 I, I haven't found your, uh, your, dis your, 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 your discussion. Uh, yeah, I think the working class, um, the organised working class uh, is not, does not, I, beg you, I thought it was, its definition was how does it defend itself and, and its, uh, its family members, uh, how did it pre prevent them from being exploited and killed and injured and that, all the rest of it. It unites and that's the only thing that it has. I beg your pardon, the other thing though is as Mar Marx in particular honed in on the German working class and the British working class because they were the most scientifically enlightened. They, the, the, the capitalist class had to teach them about science, they had to teach them about um, uh, everything in order to make the, make the guns, make the tanks, make the, 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 the factories. Um, so on the one hand they had to force them to unite, to congregate, to assemble, but it also meant that they had to teach them and eventually that notion of humankind being the most intelligent species on earth, which unless it cherishes its, the, 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 the circumstances of its, its ecosystem, it won't survive until the end. And at that point, when that generation is finally produced, and they, through the organized working class, only through the organized working class, say, it's our task to save humankind from a premature extinction brought about by um, the capitalist class, at that point we stand a chance. Otherwise, and that's the point that we're at. But, but I don't see a Marxist organization that is clearly putting that into the labor movement. I, you know, I'm, I would happily join it if I could find that. <laughs> Well, you raised a lot of things. I obviously can't answer all of these, but I mean, on your your point about Kant and Hegel and the traditions around uh, those arguments about nature. I mean, obviously, this is not the talk for that. I mean, you're really referring to what people mainly call the young Marx, so the writings of the 1844, 45, and really, it's a question of yes, Marx's final dialectic is nature and humans, and then coming to terms with that. 
history is firstly nature, and then humans come, and then we have the synthesis of that. And that's important because the end game, as we call it now, does matter. In other words, socialism, communism, wherever we're heading, matters. And people used to say, you've got to always have that glint of socialist hope in your eye when you speak. Otherwise, it's deadly dull and defeatist. So I agree. But as you also know, Marx and Engels actually didn't write very much about the nature of socialism and communism in the future. I mean, they just assumed a lot which was around the utopian, uh, and although they were anti-utopians, but they had elements of that in their thing. But basically, their imagery, which is taken up by all of us later, is fairly straightforward. I mean, people understand what a better life means, what a more cooperative life means, what a less destructive life means, and what a life without war means, what a, a life without colonial, imperial exploitation means. So Lenin, you know, when Lenin talked about freedom, he didn't say free to do, he said freedom from, didn't he? Freedom from hunger, freedom from fear, freedom from want. And when Bevan set up the NHS, his book was called Freedom from Fear, Fear of Being Ill and old and uncared for. So a lot of that we understand, and you're quite right to remind us that there is an end game, that there is a purpose to struggle, yeah, and that it is to achieve a better, fairer, juster society. And Corbyn actually does... Yeah, we all know we're going to die. It's just a question of yeah, yeah. enjoying that bit between now and yeah, then. Yeah, and Corbyn is very clear. He does emphasise the question of a juster world and a fairer world. And I mean, in another talks I give, I tend to stress that the most important problem facing us is inequality. That inequality has never been greater in the world, bizarrely. The rich have never been richer, and relatively the poor have never been poorer. So I said, when I'm in Malawi, people are dropping dead in the streets in 2018, 2019, and Bezos is worth 100 billion. I mean, it's extraordinary. And that inequality between people, groups, families, nations, regions, breeds instability. And it's that instability that brings labor mobility, immigration, migration, all the tensions that brings. It brings border wars, it brings regional wars around land and around peak populations. And that is a threat. Now your threat goes beyond that to what the fashionable word existential threat to humanity and the planet because of uh, the destruction of nature. And the, I mean, it is, it is the thing that drives most of us. The sheer waste, isn't it? I have these arguments about unemployment because when they talk about efficiency of labor markets and how people are in the right jobs, they ignore unemployed people. I said, you've got five million unemployed. What about their energy, their skills, their lives? Yeah? All the people in the wrong jobs, yeah? wasting all that so we have i think the biggest tragedy is is and most people see this is simply wasted lives yeah it's not using this terrific creativity and energy for a common better purpose and that's what keeps people as socialists in the darkest days when mandela was in jail and took, you know what goes through his mind day in day out but that we can have a better world you know, and so these are important points to raise on the philosophical area. On the more pragmatic side about trade unions, well, there's always been a debate, not only in the British trade union, but others, about whether we are what are called here and now pragmatists. I'm fighting today for better health and safety, better wages, better job security, blah, 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 which is the bread and butter of collective bargaining and everyday trade unionism, and why most people belong to unions, and why most people get active in unions. But unions also cannot in ignore the context. And I'm also a visiting professor in Zimbabwe, uh, where I visit, obviously, <laughs> and the, the trade union movement there, as in South Africa, has had to be part of the liberation movement. It couldn't simply be a wages functionary, and therefore, inevitably, was drawn into political elements. And in Britain, the same, that the union movement, despite itself, despite what people call its typical economism, that is its focus on wages only, understood there's no point putting up wages as inflation's going up. There's no point putting up wages if jobs are being lost. There's no point putting up wages if people are still at risk through dangerous work. And so 
in order to do this, we know the history of British trade unionism was that they, they couldn't win enough concessions for the bosses, the state had to intervene. The state had to bring in laws on health and safety, the state had to intervene, and if you're going to have state regulating employment issues, you have to have a vehicle, and the vehicle is the Labour Party. You have to set up your own political party to do that, and the debate on the left in Britain is, do we all pour into the Labour Party and fight like hell for left leadership and a left program, which we finally achieved, and then fight like hell for Corbyn to get elected, knowing that he's a trustworthy man, which he is? Or do we say, as many people have, Labour Party, wash my hands, always betrays us, always lets us down, always disappointing, we need either to do another party, or we need to be no party, or we need to be outside sniping in rather than inside sniping out. And the, but these, I show your anger, but these are ultimately tactical questions. So when you talk about the trade unions, they're not all in the same position at the same time. I do work at the moment for the railway union, for the civil service union, for Unite, and for the um, fire brigade union. So I, I work, I mean, I see them all the time, I'm working with them. And they've all got different agendas. They've got different power base. They've got different uh, ways of securing. So while they all agree on the ends, which is secure, better jobs, so on and so on, they can't all go about it in the same way. I mean, the civil servants are dispersed. I mean, people don't live, you know, but civil servants are very badly paid. Very badly paid. I mean, average age wage about 17, 18,000 for a full time job. And, and they're badly treated. It's not, a, it's not the glamour job people think for most civil servants. Right? But they're dispersed all over the country. It's very incredibly difficult to organise. The fire brigade union is completely different. Half the members are in London. Right? They're all firefighters. They're, they're solid, they understand what it means. So different unions, different groups of workers, but the same ends. The question really is how do they support each other and how do they move beyond their own fight and struggle to the greater fight and struggle? And some do and some don't. I mean, this is the point you know, where we're at. What do we do next, as Lenin famously said? <laughs> what is to be done? was a question he asked and which we still ask. Sorry. I, I know I haven't answered your point, but I, time is limited. <coughs> First of all, it's very nice to see you put the case behind the books that you write. Especially, I would like to be thankful for the Ronaldson's oh. of Bible, <laughs> which really teaches us a lot, because we were very interested in the Labour Party, as well as in the Communist Party, CBGB. So you gave a lot of, I mean, writing from through his life style. Excellent. Um, I would like to make a few points before you reply your question about what to do. Um, just one point is you said that uh, before capitalism and after capitalism, of course, the market is different. I will say also state is different, very different, yes. incredibly different. The only reason I see, the major reason, why the capitalist state is very different, because you are not having a whip. You are making the working class to believe, to be equal, make the guy to sit down and sign the contract with the uh, boss, which is the capitalist. So that is an, in itself is a major issue to organize where the bureaucracy comes in, where the whole state is developed, is related with how to make the worker naturally um, coming and thinking that, yes, he's going to earn a favorite fair wage. So everything doesn't turn around that. That was one point. Another point, I think that's right, a beautiful article on lace makers. I read it and I cried. You can't stop crying, basically. It says that um, the lace makers given a uh, pillow, along the pillow, all these uh, bits and pieces of food was there in order not 
them to stop, but eat like this. And the lace makers were basically couldn't have children uh, because of the sitting situation, disturb their physical being. And the people were looking at, ah, oh, these are lace makers, and they were walking. Uh, it happened in uh, the recent years that in the Silicon Valley, we had heard the um, IT workers given bed. If they want to sleep, they can go and sleep, no problem. Ah, we said, wow, wow, you know, this new working class uh, appearing and they are doing the conference. But they, it wasn't so soon, only so soon they start to say, shouting, they are exploiting us to our feet, you know. That is very similar. Some happened a thousand, hundreds of years ago, and the other one is happening now. Uh, so there is no difference, but the nature is the same. Division of the working class. Uh, you said that the, in the left, the consultation was very fair. Uh, let's say not fair, but it is not, they don't know how to consult, basically, which is extremely difficult. Because I see that in the EU, for example, in the Economic and Social Committee, uh, you sit uh, as, as people, and the people on the about, they say, what's the difficulties, what's the problems you are having? So the actual people say, my husband was in the prison, such and such and such and happened. Immediately the judge says, right, to the secretaries, and the secretary is right. That needs to be legislated. Actual people say that. <coughs> Left has no idea about that. Then they go to the black struggle, at the minor struggle, whatever, they get fidgeting, fidgeting, because they have bigger ideas, better ideas, they have no right, sorry, patience for to listen something small, which is actual everyday life. If you don't understand the everyday life, I mean, I'm saying to you because you are writing on the trade union struggle, being in it, if you don't involve in any practice, you can't see the magnitude of the issue. Unless you do, the practice is important. But if, if, if you are informed by the theory, so it will be easy for you to analyze what you are seeing and hearing. Uh, black and ethnic minority struggle is one of the important things, but also the male and female differences in the work, um, labor market and also in the workplace is very important. Able and disabled, and you can name it more. Uh, this is the unity, I will say, but to my opinion, particularly, this unity will never come unless we put our finger on the globalization. Globalization now is in the monopoly of um, neoliberal capitalism. We don't need to accept that. We need to, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. We have three minutes to stop. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We need to. We need to really make sure that the, this uh, issue is addressed <coughs> global globalization from an angle that it is what we want, what so, sort of globalization we are trying to see. Because dealing with the, I mean, white working class. Not necessarily white, but they don't understand that they are not white. They are <laughs> white. They will, I mean, the best people will deal with this issue, the Bergen ethnic minority issue, from an angle that um, all the poor people, we need to help them to get the job, blah, blah, blah. Okay? In order to get that, you need to realize that there is one globe, only, not two. Right? We are all in it. Um, that globalization, what the Marxism teaches to us, we need to develop something, some sort of a perspective, and organize in it. And I also... Uh, uh, no, I mean, maybe we should yeah. leave the last two minutes also, to Roger. Yeah, also, <laughs> I would like to see... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would like yeah. to see that the um, Labour Party is not a solution, to my opinion. They, I mean, I respect because you are in the mood, so I can understand. But the Communist Party uh, and Marxism 
in a way that it can enlighten the way. So I think we need to organize separate working class organizations. Okay, uh, 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 just two, two, very quickly. Firstly, on your question of detail structure, it's absolutely perfect point. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm doing some work and with a group of people doing work with the Indian Garment uh, Workers Union in India which is an all-female union because they broke away from the bigger union because the men were harassing them, even though they're Marxists. <laughs> uh, so they broke away. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's fantastic. Day by day, we're looking at every single minute of the day. We're asking Keith Diary of everything that happens, how they're fighting back, and they're making enormous difference to the lives of the working-class women in India and at the t same time raising consciousness. So it's a wonderful... Example, and you're absolutely right, the detail of the intensity of exploitation and the variation of exploitation is something we should be shouting loud and clear. And in fact, it's one of the features of trade union branches and even of the TUC is that people get up and say, this is what's happened to me. And somebody else gets up and says, this is what's happened to me. And when you listen and hear, you can begin, as I always conclude my books, Marxism, can join the dots that makes the final picture that nobody else can do. So you're quite right on that. On globalisation, again, I agree totally. Only a out-and-out -out Marxist view of capitalism, because globalisation is just a stage of capitalism. It's not, not different. Neoliberalism is just a strategic shift which can change and change again. We do. It's not permanent. So only in a Marxist analysis of the nature of the capitalist system is capable of embracing a, a critique of neoliberal policies and of globalisation. But we can't, what we can't do, and this is important, is we can't put the genie back in the bottle. We can't say it's globalisation no more. We can't abolish it. You can't put it back in the bottle. So what you have to do is understand it and see it as part of a destructive capitalist system and the crisis, now the final point, and this is the danger for us, is as the crisis comes, as the 2008 crisis showed, people will lurch to the right, to the populists, to the easy solutions, to its other people's fault, not the capitalists, as well as to the left. And this is the balance of class forces. This is our historic function, is to lead the way to the left. So people go that way not to the others. We don't have time to discuss whether the Soviet Union and China today are or are not communist countries. <laughs> next time, next sorry, time, yes. next time. <laughs> I've been to China many times and know many countries, <coughs> so I'm particularly uh, interested yes. in that question. Well, I think they have to Communism stop this, with the Chinese face. This very interesting <laughs> debate, unfortunately, nothing lasts forever. <laughs> so thank you very much. This was, this was amazing. Thank you. 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 Thank